2 Samuel 21, I'm trying to figure out a title, I usually wait for you know, the title to be at the, the end of uh, when you've done all your notes and stuff, and uh, this is kind of, a, this chapter is not so much uh, chronological as it is thematic, it doesn't happen in necessarily, this is not like right after the events of uh, 2 Samuel 20, and and following along. It's just another set of events in David's life. So this is more thematic, taking events from David's life to kind of say, okay, this is how we're kind of closing the book, the epilogue of David's life. And then we see here uh, the kind of finishing off of the the house of Saul, or the the last kind of word that we hear about the house of Saul, and these very important concepts that come up here. And also the Philistines uh, reappear with, with relatives of Goliath coming back. And we see David's kind of retirement as far as military prowess and, and military usefulness. And so we'll see those things as the... the author of Samuel kind of brings these things together to highlight some different aspects of where David's at, where the kingdom's at, where the Davidic covenant is at at this time, and, and, and kind of presents the, the need. It's a little bit anticlimactic here as far as David, because we're used to, the last time we heard of really Goliath is, is David and Goliath, and that's the story we all get in Sunday school. And then here, at, you know, toward the end of the, the books of Samuel, we see kind of David's relatives and, and David kind of coming to an end as far as his uh, military ability in being able to uh, fight the descendants of Goliath. They still win, but it's it's more narrow and it is less um, climactic. It, it's less uh, dramatic in terms of David's victory. So we revisit these kind of two concepts of Saul and the Philistines. They're kind of in the beginning of the books, and then they're kind of closing the book as well. And uh, so the end of the reign of David kind of comes full circle, and we're going to see some final judgment for the the house of Saul that's that's still alive, and final victory against the Philistines. So let's look at uh, verse 1, but just part of uh, verse 1 here. So now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And it says, and then David sought the presence of the Lord. And in biblical theology, in a biblical narrative, this is not just stating a fact. You know, we have to ask why, uh, why was there a famine? And there can be two kind of potential problems with, you know, disasters like famines. And they're kind of two equal extremes or problems with interpreting something like a famine even now. <clears throat> and one would be interpreting it devoid of God, taking God out of the equation, just saying it's a, uh, I almost wrote in here, said in here, a natural disaster, which we refer to as, you know, a hurricane or a fire or an earthquake, that are, there are natural forces at work. And we, you know, don't necessarily attribute those to God. But so there can be one way of thinking of totally devoid of God, but also interpreting events like that as solely the, the judgment of God in a specific way for a specific uh, reason that we have to interpret. And we don't always have that interpretation available to us directly from Scripture. Uh, so in one pitfall, there's the kind of anti-supernatural uh, Western Enlightenment worldview that we kind of live in that's, that kind of takes God out of the equation. And on the other side, there's kind of the uh, overconfidence and in interpretation of what God's doing with a particular event and interpreting certain things as, as definitely the judgment of God for uh, this one and only reason, and which comes up in that issue comes up uh, even in the life of Jesus, you know, when uh, 
the disciples asked, you know, what about the, the blind man? Whose sin was this? They, they got the right idea that, that the blindness and, you know, is part of a Genesis 3 and a sin, you know, fallen and sin cursed world. <clears throat> but they didn't really get the, you know, the idea that um, they interpreted it as, okay, was well, this man's particular sin or his partic- parents' particular sin that caused him to be blind? And there can be. You know, when we don't have the word of God to tell us the reason why that can be a pitfall as well. In this case, however, the, the word of God interprets exactly why there, this particular famine occurs. So in verse 1, it says, David sought the presence of the Lord, and the Lord said, It is for Saul and his bloody house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. So we may read famine and just think it was a circumstance or a development in the story, uh, but famine in Israel has to be understood in terms of Old Testament law and in terms of Old Testament theology. And famine and drought in Israel are a curse of the law for covenant disobedience. And so David is seeing this famine continue to happen Year after year, there's probably no rain, and it's causing this, this major issue uh, that can lead to starvation, that can lead to disease, that can lead to death. We're not really familiar with the idea of, uh, thankfully, with a famine uh, in, in our world, and, and we're... Uh, it could still happen, and it, you know, but we're so dependent on uh, factors of you know international trade and other things that that doesn't uh, affect us like it, it used to in these times when a famine meant uh, really starvation. This was the, a norm often in this time, and so this is a, the judgment of God, and and Saul uh, and David is told it is because of Saul. Okay, so so Saul is still having, even though he's he's already dead. Saul is still having some sort of impact in his house. His bloody house is still having some sort of an impact because of Saul's sin. Uh, it is having a ripple effect on uh, the, the kingdom itself. And, and the, even in that word, it is for Saul and his bloody house. You can even see that David has a bloody house too. He, uh, his house was going to have the sword uh, continually in it and death until the end of the age basically is what what he's told so David is is told this and if we read uh, just a few sections from the law let's just fill this out a little bit in Deuteronomy uh, 28 you can turn there I'll just read a few verses but in Deuteronomy 28 15 lays out you know what the law curses are going to be it says but it shall come about that if you do not obey do not hear the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I charge you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you and then he lays out all the the curses and then so in verses uh, 23 and 24 is one example of this that might be in play here says the heaven over your head shall be bronze and the earth that is under you iron the Lord will make the rain of your land powder and dust from heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed so maybe no rain uh, maybe dust storm you know things like this uh, as well Uh, Deuteronomy 28 uh, verses 47 and 48 also describe this judgment. It says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with uh, with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord your God will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness in lack of all things, and he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. And so those are just a few examples of some of the law curses that might be in play here because of covenant breaking, covenant disobedience to the law. And if you remember from studying Deuteronomy, 
that Moses says, I'm laying before you blessing and curse. And he gives a short section in Deuteronomy 28 saying, okay, here's the blessings that will come upon you. You're not going to have scarcity. You're not going to have, you're, you're going to have uh, no lack of abundance. You're going to have all these things. And it's going to be kind of a reversal of the, the curse of, of Genesis 3. But he only talks about that briefly. He says, okay, now that's your potential. <clears throat> In theory, that if you obeyed, that's exactly what would happen to you. But we're going to talk about the curses. I'm going to give you the long section and all the details on the curses because that's what's actually going to happen uh, because you're not going to obey. And so he lays out the curses for them. So fast forward years later to David, and now David's experiencing this famine, and the Lord tells him it's because of Saul's breaking of that covenant uh, with the Gibeonites. And <clears throat> so this is a 400 year old covenant from Joshua 9. If you remember that after Moses dies, the uh, Israelites go into the land and they're supposed to eradicate the people of the land. This one time uh, judgment to, to totally rid the land of everyone from, uh, for God's purposes. And the Gibeonites are able to deceive Joshua by saying, we, we don't actually live here, we're, we live really far away, and we're here now, and you can tell by our you know, outfits that, that we're not going to be any threat to you, so make a, make a covenant with us. And so they make a, a league, or they make a covenant with the Gibeonites, which they were not supposed to do, but the Lord did take that covenant seriously and, and honor that covenant. And so at some point... Saul, in his zeal, ends up killing a bunch of the Gibeonites, which is, uh, becomes a problem because they've now broken this, this covenant and the Lord is now judging Israel on behalf of the sin of its leaders, Saul and his house. <clears throat> so even a covenant that shouldn't have been made, God still took, uh, took seriously. So let's look at verses 2 through 6 of 2 Samuel 21. David's given the reason. It says, So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the sons of Israel, but were uh, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The sons of Israel made a covenant with them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. Thus David spoke to the Gibeonites what should I do for you? And how can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, we have no concern of silver or gold with Saul or his house, nor is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, I will do for you whatever you say. So they said to the king, The man who consumed us and who planned to exterminate us from remaining within the border of Israel, let seven men from his sons be given to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. So it may seem a bit strange to us of what's going on here. So the Gibeonites, this, this event where Saul killed them is not necessarily described it's just in other places it's just mentioned here but it says Saul and his zeal killed the wrong people so he's chosen in a way of the the people to be the king and then he kills the wrong people and is, is not able to bring together the kingdom because he's not obedient to the Lord and we're going to see the same thing with uh with David in a way there there is a, there are similarities between them, except that David is is chosen and is that man after God's own heart. Uh, so there's this problem with Saul, and what David offers the Gibeonites is, okay, I'll, I'll do whatever you ask, and they ask for uh, the men of, of Saul's house. Uh, so you know why why is this the case? And as a side uh, note here. David even asks, you know, how can I make atonement in verse 3? And, you know, people looking at this may 
wonder or, or with a more critical eye may say, well, this is like human sacrifice. You know, this is uh, extreme. This is crazy. And even in the, the Christian community, not in the, the evangelical community, there's been challenges in the last, well, really it's, it's been over 50 years, but it's come to uh, more of a sharp focus in the last 30 years of this idea uh, in a New Testament sense that Jesus could not have died for uh, under the wrath of God as, as a punishment, actually taking on the punishment of God as a substitution that, uh, that the Bible, that that's a foreign concept to the Bible. Now we know that that's you know, the, the heart of the gospel, but there have been many books written in this uh, context, one starting with a uh, writer, uh, C.H. Dodd in the, the 1950s, really questioning that concept of, of propitiation that you, that uh, a man could uh, die before God as as a blood sacrifice and 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 propitiate God that could extinguish the wrath of God as and take on that punishment and so he really questioned the idea of propitiation later on more recently in books uh, there was a book a few years ago in the early 2000s called. The, the lost message of, of Jesus, which said that to believe this would, you know, since God the Father punishes God the Son, this would be a cosmic form of, of child abuse and that the Bible does not allow human sacrifice. And, and so this has been dealt with you know, by many different theologians, but this is a, a, an idea that's, that's out there that, is be, that has gained some ground but really has not... Uh, penetrated the, the church in the sense of uh, being a threat to evangelical theology, but it is some thought that is, that is out there. Uh, and this uh, type of section of scripture uh, reaffirms the, that context of what, you know, what the biblical context really is as far as how can uh, one person represent many individuals and then take on a punishment uh, for them. And so this is what is, you know, going on here as, as well. Not in a salvific way, not in a, a way that, that saves from sin, but in a way that a leader does represent the people and does take on the, the consequences of the people. And the people either suffer or are benefited by the decisions and the, the position of their, their leader, for, for better or worse. And, and we know that even today to be true, that, uh, that political people in positions of political power, uh, we will suffer for their, uh, their commitment to uh, things that are against the Lord, or we will be benefited by their commitment to things that are for the Lord, and, and all those uh, issues, you know, that we have to deal with the consequences of. Uh, but this is in a more direct way here. So what the Gibeonites ask for is we want uh, justice to be done here. We want the punishment to be uh, made complete for Saul's house. And so David... Uh, says, you know, how can I, in verse 3, how can I make atonement? And usually we think of atonement in terms of animal sacrifice, maybe to pay for sin. But here, the, the idea is more representational discipline for covenant breaking. Somebody has to uh, pay the price. And so what they ask for is they want to, uh, to hang these men. And this isn't Western hanging with, uh, with a rope, necessarily. This is a death of, uh, of hanging impalement. This is very common in the ancient Near East, and this is also represented in the, the law, Deuteronomy 21-23, that cursed is the man who hangs on a tree, that that represents the curse of God, and then they're to be buried. So we already saw that with, uh, with Absalom. He gets hung up by his hair, by not... Uh, David, not by any individual, but by the providence of the Lord, he ends up hung, uh, and then they pierce him with, uh, with darts, with spears, and uh, then they bury him, so that 
and David had also inflicted this death on the men who uh, murdered uh, one of Saul's sons and said, hey, we, we beheaded this guy for you. And then David hung both of them up on, on a wall uh, and cut their hands off, cut their feet off uh, to show that this was a, a cursed death. And so <clears throat> this is what David is following as well. And by the way, David will also <clears throat> bring this up in, in Psalm 22 in language speaking of himself, that if the king is right with God and is suffering, he's going to use language like they've cut off my hands and my feet. They've pierced my hands and my feet. They, they've hung me up on the, the horns of the bowl. They've, you know, they've done these things. He uses animal imagery to talk about being torn apart, being dislocated, things like this that, that happened during a, uh, a death of, of hanging or a death of piercing uh, or a death of crucifixion. And so this was uh, before Roman crucifixion, but this is a very common uh, concept in the ancient Near East. Some other uh, words that go along with this, uh, this concept, we want to hang them in verse uh, 6, <clears throat> is uh, to execute in, in the New American Standard, Numbers 25.4, that also in other versions will say hang. Uh, another word is impale hang to hang up, uh, even to bring it into a, another context in the future, crucify is an appropriate word, uh, to dislocate both uh, spiritually, to, to separate from the group, uh, to, to expose some translations say, but, but also there's a dislocation of bones that takes place during hanging. Uh, there's also the concept of alienate, to, to of that this person is, is alienated, separate from the group, and is experiencing this, this punishment. So you have here this concept of uh, corporate solidarity, that the leaders in the house of Saul are held responsible. This also goes back to uh, the time of Moses in Numbers 25, when the people, when uh, the people uh, apostatize and they turn towards Baal and they start worshiping Baal uh, with sexual immorality and all sorts of things and God brings a plague on them uh, and to stop the plague Moses appeals to the Lord and, and God says hang all the leaders uh, and then that would stop the, uh, the judgment of God against the people and of course as you know one one man continues, and uh, Phineas, and the plague continues, and Phineas hangs him. He pierces him uh, with a, with a spear, and so that's that idea. There is is what was necessary to stop the plague. So we see that the sin of the people and their representative leaders brings that curse that has to be uh, atoned for, and that's what David is even recognizing here with people who are not the people of God, that are the Gibeonites. And their pagan practice that they believe in, in propitiation too, but in a, in a more human sacrifice type of way, that the Lord in his providence accepts that as sufficient uh, to pay for uh, the sin of Saul and his house. But this is the last word pretty much that we get on Saul and his house, and that, that it's, a, it's a cursed uh, house, it's a cursed Death, and so David offers to give <coughs> give these sons. Let's read verses seven through nine. It says, "But the king spared Mephibosheth, okay, so the son of Jonathan, there that he had a covenant with. The son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath of the Lord, which was between David and Saul's son Jonathan. So the king took." Two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, uh, Armoni and Mephibosheth, different Mephibosheth, whom she had borne to Saul, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she had borne to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Mahilathite. <coughs> then he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the mountain before the Lord. So that the seven of them fell together, and they were put to death in the first days of the harvest, at the beginning of the wheat harvest. So they actually uh, gave them over 
And these men hung them up. Uh, and it even says before the Lord. David said, do this so that you can bless the inheritance of the Lord. Now that the question is whether or not this is sufficient, whether or not the Lord is actually going to uh, accept this. And then it does begin to rain. So the Lord does accept this as uh, consistent with the law uh, of Deuteronomy enough to, to bring an end to that, that law curse. So even though the Gibeonites are doing something that's, that's not totally in line, they, for example, they don't bury the body the same day and, uh, and all these things, uh, the Lord does allow that to uh, pay for the injustice of the house of Saul from previous year. So, uh, the last thing that's kind of mentioned of Saul and his house is Saul and Jonathan, after they were killed, they were taken uh, by the Philistines and their their bodies, they were killed in, in battle and all these things, but then their bodies as a sign of, of humiliation and victory for the Philistines, their bodies were taken and, and pinned uh, to a wall so their, their corpses, their bones would have still been there. So David, <clears throat> as kind of a last action to, to honor the, the kingship of Saul and, and, and Jonathan uh, goes to or sends to get these these bones back and give them a real burial. So even though there's this obvious curse over the house of Saul, not curse in like a magic way, but uh, you, as you know, but a curse and um, way of God's judgment, David does bring them back out of respect for uh, the kingship and probably love for. <coughs> Jonathan, and we do still see some irony here of, of David's sin. He does not kill Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, but it says, and, and he had a covenant with, uh, with Mephibosheth, but he had broken it. And was in 2 Samuel 9, he had, showed, he had acted like the Lord, had shown love and kindness, but uh, after that he was deceived and he broke the covenant with Mephibosheth in a really uh, treacherous way. And then said, okay, I'm not going to totally deal with the problem, and I'm going to allow you and, and Ziba to, to divide it, and I'm not going to deal with you anymore. So he doesn't kill him, but it's not because of the covenant David has with him, it's because of the covenant David has with Jonathan. So he still honors Jonathan, but he, um, there is still some of David's hypocrisy here with uh, how, he, <clears throat> how he still treated Mephibosheth. Um, but he is spared in this, this instance. Let's read uh, verses 10 through 14, talking about how David uh, deals with the bones of uh, Saul and Jonathan. It says, And Rizpah, the daughter of Ahab, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until it rained on them from the sky. And she allowed neither the birds of the sky uh, to rest on them, by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. <clears throat> when it was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, uh, the concubine of Saul, had done, then David went, so notice a the difference there between David, you, David, the problem in, from 2 Samuel 11 until this point is David's been sending. The key word there is, is sent. He, he always sends, and it's, it's almost always for the wrong thing. He sends for Bathsheba, he sends for men, he sends for Uriah, he sends him into battle, he sends for all these different things. He's no longer acting personally. But David actually goes here in verse 12. So it says, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the main, men of Jabesh Gilead who had stolen them from the open square of Bashan, where the Philistines had hanged them on the day the Philistines struck down Saul and Gilboa. So notice they had been hung up, their bodies had been hung up as well. He brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, uh, <clears throat> from there, and they gathered the bones uh, who had been hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin in Zela, in the grave of Kish his father, thus they did all that the king commanded, and after that God was moved by prayer for the land. Okay, so 
God is obviously honoring what David did, not only in his giving over the, the kind of final sons of, of Saul's house to the Gibeonites, but God is also honoring this, uh, this action towards Saul and towards Jonathan. So David is, is n- making it clear that he's not disparaging the office of the king, and he's not disparaging Saul and Jonathan as individuals. Because even remember that after, in the beginning of Second Samuel, that after Jonathan and Saul had died, and David uh, got the news, and the person who came to him, the young man, thought he was bringing good news and said, hey, I killed Saul for you, here's his crown, here's his scepter, here's his stuff. Uh, they had him put to death. And then uh, David sings a song about really the the kingdom. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. That's where that that statement that we say and it's said in movies and things like that, it comes from. And it's a song of mourning for the death of the king and the the meaning that that has for the kingdom, that it has an impact for Israel, it has an impact for the world, it has an impact on the the actual land in terms of how God would deal with the land, and that the song also has the the phrase in it, tell it not in Gath, don't let the the enemies of the Lord... uh, be victorious, be happy, be grateful, uh, and think that they have some sort of edge over, that they have some sort of victory over the people of God, and that their gods are, are more powerful than the God of Israel. And so he, he brings back uh, these, these bones and, and buries them, so that there is some sort of honor towards the end amidst that, that curse. And it's not honor because... Saul necessarily deserves it, or even Jonathan necessarily deserves it in and of themselves, but <clears throat> because of the importance of what God does with that office of the king. In the next section, we're going to see here really David's forced retirement. Okay, this is something, a, a concept that's kind of, I describe it that way because that's a little bit... Uh, more familiar with us what's happening. So David is going out <clears throat> to fight the Philistines. So we hear about Saul again, and then we hear about, toward the end here, the Philistines again. And we're going to hear about relatives of Goliath again. So we might expect, wow, this is going to be like David and Goliath too, but you know, it's like all sequels. It's not as, uh, it's not as good as the original because David's just not as, uh, <clears throat> David's not what he used to be. And that's the point, is that David has, has declined and he is, he's never able to uh, fully be all that, uh, that he should have been. If anyone should have been able to do it, it should have been David. You know, 1 Samuel uh, 16 goes out without, you know, without armor. He, you know, it's, it's the famous David and Goliath story. And, and, and even there we see that the idea of uh, of representative champions of both sides, uh, that the you know the echoes of the seed of the the woman and the seed of the serpent, and you know fighting together, and David's trust in in the Lord uh, to to be able to uh, take on Goliath, not in himself, but because of the Lord, and <clears throat> toward the end here, uh, David uh, Goliath's sons, you know, and and relatives are are present, um, and David's just not the same. Uh, his, his military might has, uh, has declined, and so he's kind of in this position of where his, he's lived beyond his, uh, his usefulness. And for us, I may say, well, you know, he's still a godly guy, he still writes psalms, and, and that's fine, but uh, and that is true. We, we can see that as far as our, our perspective goes. But in, in this time, for the king to not be able to uh, lead the people in, in military uh, might meant that the, it was pretty much over for David, that, that David's um, ability is, is gone. And so this is, you know, maybe even brings... Uh, an element of, of shame 
uh, for David and the kingdom that, that what he used to be, that yeah, David's going to go out for us and fight against the Philistines. They're now saying, uh, David, uh, I, think you're, I think you're done. Uh, you know, get turning your badge and your gun, and you know, uh, that he's he's pushed into to retirement here. Uh, and so let's look at verses <clears throat> fifteen uh, through twenty-two, and we'll just talk about uh, the the story as it as it goes. It says, "Now when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David went down and his servants with him, and they fought against the Philistines." David became weary. <clears> then <throat> Ishbi Benob, uh, who was among the descendants of the giant, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze in weight, was girded with a new sword. And he intended to kill David. And it says even there in the uh, footnote or the original, it says that he, and he was to kill David. Like that was his purpose. That was his mission. But Abishai the son of Zariah, helped him. So notice there's this uh, <coughs> contrast. What you might expect there, if we were reading this or we were writing like a, a movie or something, you know, writing a book, a script, you kind of expect, okay, similar situation. The Philistines are back, descend it. Now it's, now it's this guy who's intended to kill David. And he's, you know, kind of been bred as this unique warrior for this purpose to kill David. And we're like maybe expecting David to face another Goliath and, and take him out. Uh, but it's, it says Abishai uh, had helped him and struck the Philistine and killed him. So the Lord's still giving him victory here, but it, it's, not, it, it's not the focus on David anymore that we saw in 1 Samuel 16. It says, then, then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall not go out again with us to battle, so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. <clears throat> then verse 18, Now it came about after this, that there was war again with the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, Sebekai, the Hushethite, struck down Saph, who was among the descendants of the giant. There was war with the Philistines again at Gob. And Elhanan, the son of Jair Oregim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite. So another Goliath here. Uh, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was war at Gath again, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Six-fingered man. <laughs> Twenty-four in number, in case you couldn't do the math. Twenty-four in number, and he had also been born to the giant. When he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, so now David's nephew, struck, down, uh, struck him down. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So it's kind of this repetition, you know, to, to show us. And there's another one, you know, and they went to war again, and there's another giant. And... And they do. They kill them all. They are able to have victory over them, but it's it's not a bunch of David and Goliaths. David uh, is, remember in verse 17, uh, the men, they not only suggest, they not only ask, or they says they swore to him saying, and they're doing this out of love for David and protection of David, you shall not go out with us again to battle so that, they let him know with a statement of purpose, so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. David, we know that if we lose you um, in, a, in a horizontal sense, that it's over. We've lost the kingdom. They've, they've cut off the, the head. And so they say, you need to stay back. David's no longer able to go out with them. In verse 15, it, it describes David. It says, David became weary. David, at this point of his, his life, is not able to do 
uh, what he used to do. He's uh, declined. I was going to say declined spiritually. But th- that is true in a sense. I think what Dav- the better way to say that is that as David experienced different things and, and, and uh, experienced a, a wider variety of, of sin and uh, trials in his, his life, uh, it did shape David. It did, it did continue to bring him to the Lord. Uh, but we don't see all, you know, that, that there is a sense in a spiritual decline, which maybe he's, at this point, he is, you know, and you can see from the Psalms that he is as close to the Lord or maybe closer to the Lord than ever. But the impact of sin in his life uh, was lasting. It did have consequences all the way forward to the end, uh, and there's, you know, truth to that that it will it, it will continue to uh, impact him, even though he he may be growing closer to the Lord, that that sin is going to to cling to him, uh, and that's going to add to that weariness. He has declined, obviously, physically as he's just aged. That natural uh, process as well. And just in terms of his, his kingdom, uh, it's going into decline as well. It's going to do really well under Solomon, and it's going to hit kind of some high points where it's going to look like if, if Solomon could do it right, it, everything could be un, you know, reversed in a good way. It could go back uh, to the, you know, what it was before and be greater glory than David, but Solomon's not going to be able to, uh, to do it either, and then that's going to result in... Uh, the fractured kingdom, and so that's and that's what's going to continue. That that the kings, just like I said with with Deuteronomy before, that <clears throat> as the people of Israel and the law are presented, a blessing and curse, and you could get this blessing theoretically if you could obey, but you don't have the heart to obey. David, the Davidic kings are presented the same thing in the Davidic covenant. If you're able to obey God and then be faithful to God in the Davidic covenant. Uh, then that's going to pull all the other covenants together and, and fulfill them all. You could, you could uh, fulfill all the, the covenant of the law and administrate the law. You could fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. You could fulfill the rest and the Noahic covenant. It goes all the way back to, uh, to Genesis 3, that this would be uh, that the kingdom of God would, would overtake the earth. Um, and, and reverse the curse through that way. It would bring the, the nations to the Lord, all these things. Uh, but it's the same problem that uh, along with that is the discipline of the Davidic covenant, which uh, I was going to say curse. There is curse with the Davidic covenant as well, that it's curse for sin and suffering for sin. Uh, and that's what David also writes about in, in Psalm 22, that he, he works through the concept theologically that if there was the right Davidic king that is righteous enough to, to take on the, all the sin and the, the suffering for sin and the discipline of the Davidic house and take it all, then that could be undone. Then you could reverse the whole thing. Uh, but David is not the one to be able to do that, and he knows that. And so we see that decline uh, at the, the end of his life, that he's, he's where he was before an asset in battle. He is now a liability. And so the author of Samuel puts this here strategically, even though it's not necessarily in chronological order. He, he zooms in on this area of David's life to indicate that David's uh, failure, David's imperfection, um, for some things that are his fault and some things that aren't his fault, that David is just not uh, able to be all that he should have been. Um, and it's not to say that, oh, well, it's, hope is lost. It's to create a sense of uh, anticipation for how the will of God, how the kingdom of God will be worked out uh, when you don't have the right kings, when the kings are only going to fail um, what you need then is, is a perfect king. Uh, and that, so that is setting up for that in the future. So David's decline actually leaves a sense of hope. Uh, and it also creates in David and others uh, this sense of um, messianic expectation. That they're, they're, if you could just get the right king, uh, 
then all of this would be solved. All of this would be brought together. And so obviously that's what we see in Christ. And David sees that need uh, for Christ as well. And you see this in the, the Davidic Psalms. You see it in, in Psalm 2. Uh, the, you know, the Lord's anointed, the Lord installs his king and the, the nations of the earth are subservient to him. You see it in Psalm 16 and David's uh, idea of the, that the king would have to conquer death, that, uh, that David faces death with hope, but he says there would have to be a, a greater hope because the king would have to uh, reverse death. You see it in Psalm 22 where the nations and all the peoples are, are brought to, to worship the Lord because uh, the king is delivered from death. Well, that never happens with David. You see it in all, all, you know, in all kinds of psalms. You could all go through a ton of uh, Davidic psalms and, and see this, this expectation of uh, David for <clears throat> working out the theology of um, the Davidic covenant, but then recognizing yeah, this is not, I'm not going to be able to be the one to do this. But obviously he looks ahead to, to Christ, who is that anointed one, that, that is the, uh, the Messiah who, who is able to bring together the kingdom. Uh, so let's uh, close in word of prayer and then go to worship. Lord God, we thank you uh, for this time to look at the life of David and uh, to look at even his his failure and his weakness, not to see it from a sense of of moral superiority or even see it in a sense of uh, just personally looking at how sin can impact our lives, though it may be useful for those things. But Lord, to see (coughs) our need, to see that you have created this need for Christ as the right king, that uh, our salvation and what you have done in the world and that all that you have accomplished in Christ is larger than just us individually, but that as Christ died and rose again and reigns, that he has purchased uh, a kingdom and that we have become part of that, Lord, and that we represent that uh, even as we worship together this morning, Lord. So we pray that that will be <coughs> consciously on our minds as, as we Uh, worship in song and sing to you in worship and sing truth to one another and that that will be on our minds as we uh, sit under submission to the word of God uh, preached as Christ uh, rules from his throne over us Lord so we affirm his uh, his kingship and his his lordship his right to rule over our hearts and over our lives and we ask for uh for your help, Lord, in, in sending your, uh, your Holy Spirit to uh, create that reality in our hearts, Lord. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.